Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. We have reached the 25th episode and the last chapter, the fifth chapter of the introduction of the Synthesis of Yoga, where in this chapter, Sri Aurobindo will give us the overview of the synthesis he has been gradually building up. Very first chapter, Life and Yoga, where he brought to our understanding all life is yoga and yoga is already happening in nature, subconscious yoga that is becoming conscious in us. In the second chapter, Three Steps of Nature, where he showed three evolutionary steps from the gross body to the progressive mind to the spiritual self. And in the third chapter, he brought in the threefold life where these three steps, they how they interact interdependent, see of these three. And in the fourth chapter, he gave us the systems of yoga and how each system of yoga uses one part or other as it has already established by nature in our evolutionary journey. Each school uses one part to make the contact with the divine consciousness. And there is an ascending ladder in that progression from Hatha Yoga, Raja Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga. So these five schools he gave an overview, a gist, and now he is taking up the synthesis of the systems. And you can find the description where below, description below where you can find the link to this chapter. And I highly recommend you keep the text with you so that we can enjoy the journey together line by line. Let's begin. The synthesis of the systems. By the very nature of the principal yogic schools, each covering in its operations a part of the complex human integer and attempting to bring out its highest possibilities, it will appear that a synthesis of all of them largely conceived and applied might well result in an integral yoga. So this could be our general impression where largely conceiving all these five schools, bringing them together as a larger picture, bringing all their practices and methods could be integral yoga. That is our normal way of thinking, but he is going to point us towards something else. It's interesting to see the usage, human integer, the complex human integer. An integer is a whole number. Then there are fractions. Even though we, the humans, are complex in our nature, it's not a fraction, it is a whole. So he is referring a part of the complex human integer. Very interesting imagery. So now I will go through line by line. By the very nature of the principal yogic schools, each covering in its operations a part. So each yogic school is covering a part of the complex human integer. Human being is a complex whole out of which a part is used by one or other yogic school because that part become the starting point for making the contact. So Sri Aurobindo in the previous chapter explained when he strip out all the specific modalities of practice and you touch what is the core principle, you will come in touch with the, a part of the, our complex human nature that is used as the 
central principle for the making of the contact. So each covering in its operations a part of the complex human integer and attempting to bring out its highest possibilities, that particular part's highest possibilities. If it is intellect, the highest possibilities of the intellect. If it is human emotions, then refining it and elevating it to its highest possibilities. If it is human will, elevating it into its highest possibilities. If it is the body, then elevating the body to its highest possibilities. So all this we have seen. It will appear that a synthesis of all of them largely conceived and applied might well result in an integral yoga. But they are, not, they are so disparate in their tendencies, so highly specialized and elaborate, elaborated in their forms, so long confirmed in their mutual opposition of their ideas and methods that we do not easily find how we can arrive at their right union. So we have, as we have seen already, Sri Aurobindo just broadly explained five different schools. Even if we look at just these five, there is quite some opposition in their approach. And that unique specialization in each path makes it impossible for them to come together. Say, Hatha Yogin has to spend most of their time in purifying and perfecting the body through active asana pranayama related kriyas and the rest of it. And we will not find them appreciating or valuing something like bhakti yoga that relies on the bhajans and love and emotions and that devotion to that deity where love is dominant. Or the, if you look at Raja Yoga, there is a reliance on Samadhi, going into deep Samadhi, where you are skipping off all the various forms of mental activities. That means the intellect and its complex possibilities, its capacity for its intellectual discernment and its development is bypassed and it won't. Similarly, when they're going into the trance, they are not looking into an active action in the world where the divine will, the karma yoga that uses the will to engage in the world and its action is missed out. So each school has its own specialization and in the process, it become incompatible because they are so different. So highly specialized and elaborated in their forms, so long confirmed in the mutual opposition of their ideas and methods. They, that we do not easily find how we can arrive at their right union. An undiscriminating combination in block would not be a synthesis. An undiscriminating combination in block without discernment, picking up some practices from one school another set of practices from another school, putting them all together, that will not be a synthesis, it will be a hodgepodge. So that is not an option. It will be a confusion. So an undiscriminating combination in block would not be a synthesis, but a confusion. Nor would a successive practice of each of them in turn be easy in the short span of our human life and with our limited energies to say nothing of the waste of labor implied in so cumbrous a process. So that's the second option that is take up one school, go to the extreme of realizing its contact with the divine, then take up the next school, the next school, 
the next school. But it takes so much time and we have our limited lifespan. And each school has its elaborate system of practice. So practically, it is impossible to do in succession one after other. Now, sometimes indeed, Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga are thus successively practiced. So this is one of the common visible form of yogic practices that we find across India, now spreading across the world. That is, Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga are thus successively practiced. So you practice your asanas, kriyas, then pranayama, quieten down, calm down, and then get into meditation and absorption inward. So the two aspects are very commonly brought together. One is from Hatha Yogic schools, other is from Raja Yogic schools. This is one of the most commonly found combination across India and now across the world. And in a recent unique example, in the life of Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, we see a colossal spiritual capacity. By the way, Sri Aurobindo is referring to as recent unique example. So let's remember he's writing the synthesis of yoga in 1914. And Sri Ramakrishna lived in the 19th century. And uh, so it was very close to him at that time. So he's writing, in a recent unique example in the life of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, we see a colossal spiritual capacity, first driving straight to the divine realization. So on the one hand, Sri Ramakrishna had a colossal spiritual capacity. He was not an average person. He was born with that colossal capacity. Then what he did? First, driving straight to the divine realization. He was a priest in a temple and through his love for the divine, through that intensity, he realized the divine, taking as it were the kingdom of heaven by violence. His love for the divine was so intense, almost violent, one might say. Taking, as it were, the kingdom of heaven by violence, like a stormy marching into the heaven by this master soul. So that was his first thing, to realize the divine. And then seizing upon one yogic method after another and extracting the substance out of it with an incredible rapidity. Always to return to the heart of the whole matter, the realization and possession of God. He did not linger in all the schools first, testing out each one. He picked up his natural path with which he realized the divine. It is after that he picked up other schools we know from history that he has explored not only Hindu yogic schools, but also Islamic pathways, Christian pathways. He used everyone. And interesting part is he was so rapid in his success. First of all, he had realized in himself the divine. Then he picked up different schools and with that colossal capacity and intense effort, in a very short time, he could realize the very essence, which is realizing the divine, very essence of all yogic schools, and arrived at the conclusion that all the pathways lead to the divine realization. And Sri Aurobindo is bringing in this picture because in the previous sentence, he mentioned 
in a short span of human life, it is practically impossible to practice in succession one school after other. But here is an example of someone who actually did it. So, and in a recent unique example in the life of Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, we see a colossal spiritual capacity, first driving straight to the divine realization, taking, as it were, the kingdom of heaven by violence, and then seizing upon one yogic method after another and extracting the substance out of it with incredible rapidity, always to return to the heart of the whole matter, the realization and possession of God by the power of love, by the extension of inborn spirituality into various experiences and by the spontaneous play of an intuitive knowledge. So these are three things he had. One was the power of love, other was the inborn spirituality and an intuitive knowledge. He was not a scholar. Even his education was very, very basic. But he had an intuitive play of knowledge, play of an intuitive knowledge. So with that, he entered rapidly and assimilated all parts. So there is an example of an individual who successively practiced various schools. Now, Sri Aurobindo is saying, such an example cannot be generalized. Because this is not how a normal human being is. He was an exceptional being. Its object also was special and temporal. Temporal. It was specific to a time period. This was an example specific to a time period. To exemplify in the great and decisive experience of a master soul the truth now most, most necessary to humanity, towards which the world, long divided into jarring sects and schools, is with difficulty laboring. So remember, this is in the 19th century. By the time India had declined and India was under colonization and various schools of yoga had withdrawn into their own seclusion, and all the sects had separated into various pathways and there was no contact with each other and union of each other. Merging of the schools was missing. It is in that context a master soul comes and picks up all the schools, all the religions and drives straight into the essential realization, stripping all the elaborate details of the processes, he could go straight to the heart of the matter and realize the divine. So he was exemplifying in himself. So its object also was special and temporal, to exemplify in the great and decisive experience of a master soul, the truth. Now most necessary to humanity, humanity needs this truth of one truth that is spread into multiple sects. Now most necessary to humanity towards which the world long divided into jarring sects and schools is with difficulty laboring. That all sects are forms and fragments of a single integral truth. So there is an integral truth that got fragmented into various branches and specialized. So, rediscovering that integral truth that is common to all the religions, all the yogic schools, that was demonstrated through the life of Sri Ramakrishna. And all disciplines labor in their different ways towards one supreme experience. So, all disciplines, all pathways and uh, various disciplines coming from the pathways, they are all different ways towards one supreme experience. So this is the 
special requirement of that particular time in history where this had to be brought out. Remember, it was Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa's prime disciple, Swami Vivekananda, who was destined to go to Chicago into the parliament of religions and declare this great truth. So Sri Ramakrishna was establishing in his personal experience this realization. It was not a conceptual synthesis, but in his personal spiritual realization. He validated all the schools, became a living example, exemplified in that master soul the truth of all the fragmented schools, pointing them towards one integral truth. To know, be and possess the divine is the one thing needful and it includes or leads up to all the rest. So this is the crux of the matter. Regardless of the various schools, religions, no matter what you look at, to know, that is knowing about the divine, and be and possess the divine. So you need to be the divine. It's not enough to know the divine as something out there as a concept. You have to be the divine. That's the only way to really know. Knowledge by identity, by becoming the divine and possess the divine. It is through that becoming the divine, there is that possession. Divine possesses the instrument and expresses through the instrument. So this is the one thing needful and it includes or leads up to all the rest. Everything else comes out of this fundamental realization. That's the core of the matter, regardless of the starting point of various schools. The divine has to be known and possess the divine and be the divine. Towards this soul good, we have to drive and this attained or the rest the divine will chooses for us. All necessary form and manifestation will be added. So what a particular human being is meant to do in the world become clear only when that realization with the union with the divine, that is accomplished. The rest is a consequence of that divine union. That is when the divine work through the instrumentation become really revealed and possible and smooth expression of that inner union. To know, be and possess the divine is the one thing needful and it includes or leads up to all the rest. Towards this soul good, we have to drive and this attained, all the rest that the divine will choose for us, all necessary form and manifestation will be added. Whatever be the form of manifestation that is meant to happen through an individual will be a byproduct. So you don't look for what is my particular work in this lifetime. That work will become visible only in proportion to the union with the divine within you. So that is the condition. So to know, be and possess the divine is the one thing needful. So let's keep that in mind. To know, be and possess the divine is the one thing needful. Everything else is a consequence. The synthesis we propose cannot then be arrived at either by combination in mass or by successive practice. So these are two ways. Combining in mass various methods of various schools or practicing in succession. He says these two modalities, this is not 
the method by which we can arrive at the synthesis. The synthesis we propose cannot then be arrived at either by combination in mass or by successive practice. It must therefore be effected by neglecting the forms and outsides of the yogic disciplines. So there are various yogic disciplines, various schools, and they have forms of practice. For example, asana is a form of practice. Pranayama is a form of practice. A particular type of meditation is a form of practice. A particular way of intellectual discernment, it is a form of practice. A bhajan is a form of practice. Karma yoga is a form of practice. A worship of the deity is a form of practice. So there are all various forms. So we need to strip out all these forms by neglecting the forms and outsides of the yogic disciplines. All the details of when you do pranayama, like say count so many and then hold, then hold, count so many numbers, then release and count. All these are outer small details. So remove everything. Neglecting the forms and outsides of the yogic disciplines and seizing rather on some central principle common to all. Here he is talking about a central principle common to, first of all, all the practices. Second, central principle common to all the schools. Because each school has its own central principle. Hatha Yoga uses the body as the central reference. Raja Yoga uses the subtle body as a central reference. Jnana Yoga uses the intellect. Bhakti Yoga uses the heart. And Karma Yoga uses the will. These are the central principles of each school of yoga. Now what is common to them? All of them. What is the common ground? So seizing rather some central principle common to all, which will include and utilize in the right place and proportion their particular principles. So when we can get hold of the central principle common to all the various yogic schools, then we can see, okay, this central principle to what proportion it needs to be used. If we are synthesizing, once we know the central principle common to all central principles, then the particular principle we can see to what extent the body is to be used as a reference, to what extent the inner subtle body is to be used, to what extent the intellect is to be used, to what extent the heart is to be used, to what extent the will is to be used. So there is a right proportion of the principles. They are particular principles, the right place and proportion. There is a right place for each principle and proportion, their particular principles, and on some central dynamic force, which is the common secret of their divergent methods. So on one hand, there is a central principle. On other hand, there is a dynamic force that makes a method effective. So we need to know the central dynamic principle, uh, central dynamic force as well. So we need to know the central principle and central dynamic force. On some central dynamic force, which is the common secret of their divergent methods. Even if the methods are divergent, there is a common secret behind divergent methods. And that secret dynamic force. We need to recognize what that is. And capable, therefore, of organizing a natural selection. So here he is giving the framework by which we can select various practices. So remember, Sri Aurobindo is not denying the methods and various practices. He is giving the central principle and central dynamic force as a reference once we know them then we can make the right selection with the right proportion and the right sequence so imagine 
something like the difference between an operating system and applications. If we know the operating system, we can select the applications that are required for a specific work or even develop a new application. So what Shirobindo is pointing out is not the application, but the operating system that is underlying. So he's saying, forget about the details of all the applications that are out there. They have a common principle and a common energy that drives. So there is an underlying framework of an operating system with which the selection of the application become possible. So, and capable therefore of organizing a natural selection and combination of their varied energies and different utilities. Because each part of our instrumental nature, whether it is body, subtle body, intellect, emotion, the will, they all have their variant type of energy and corresponding utility in our yogic development. So to combine, we need to find what is common to them all, the central principle and the central dynamic energy. So that will give us the reference for the right selection and right combination and right sequencing. This was the aim which we set before ourselves first, at first, when we entered upon the comparative examination. So from the very beginning, in the very first chapter, Sri Aurobindo set the aim. Now he is reminding us, this was the aim which we set before ourselves at first, when we entered upon the comparative examination. So this, he examined and compared different schools. Now, of the methods of nature and the methods of yoga. Here again, remember, there is methods of nature. It is yoga is nothing but something derived from nature, accelerating the processes that nature has already established. So there is methods of nature and methods of yoga. And we now return to it with the possibility of hazarding some definite solution. Here, he's very modest in saying, possibility of hazarding some definite solution. It is a potential danger to even to propose a possibility of synthesis. And yet, that's what is required. A definite solution is possible. So we have two methods. One is methods of nature, the other is methods of yoga. And methods of yoga is nothing but derived from the methods of nature and specialized into various specific schools. Nature has already established the material body and the life energy in it, and then the subtle body and its subdivisions into its intellectual possibilities, its emotional possibilities, its will, all that has already been established by nature and yogic schools use one of them, intensifies and make that as a starting point to contact the divine. And now he's bringing in what is common to all of them so that we can find a definite synthesis of all this. So with that, we come to the end of this 25th episode. Thank you for your attention and please ensure that you have subscribed to this podcast so that you get notification and click on the bell icon so that there is a notification that is coming to you and you don't miss this podcast and uh, please do share what you learned from this and any new insights, anything you would like to add to what I have already shared. I'm sure many of you must be having your own new insights, nuances. So feel free to add so that your learning also becoming useful resource for others to learn. For example, when someone come and watch this podcast and sees the comments that are below, that will become very useful for them to learn. So you are contributing to the collective learning. This is a collective yagna. So please do participate 
in sharing your insights. See you next episode. Thank you.